Well, hello, and welcome to Gallifrey's Most Wanted. I'm Ross Aiken. I'm old who. These are my top operatives, the legs, the nose, and Mrs. Robinson. I'm Leslie Aitken. I'm Mrs. Old Who. I hate you. No, you don't. <laughs> oh. Yes, uh, folks, uh, Leslie is jumped in to talk Doctor Who. Um, I'm going to, before I ask her, well, let me first, Leslie, tell, just briefly to Scott, the, I tried to get her to watch the first episode of Modern Who, and your reaction to the Autons was what? That they are a, not like the movie Mannequin. <laughs> no, they're not. It's not Kim. That is what I wanted. <laughs> no, 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 no. That is what I was expecting. <laughs> so I was a little. They were creepy. Surprised. Oh, so one day you're gonna watch Spirit, uh, Spirit from Space. That's the first third Doctor story. That's where those aliens were first introduced, and then breaking the, the them coming alive in the mall is a direct homage to the end of that story, and they're creepy. I think it's because it's a real thing. It's that kind of realness makes it creepy. Uh, yes. I and like it, creepy, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You do. Because there are movies, you watch the Peel movies, and I have no urge to see them because they will give me night terrors. Uh, it's like um, The Omen and The Exorcist. I watched them finally, and The Omen still scares the shit out of me. Um, and then, because it freaked you out, I showed you the very first Doctor Who, and you liked... I love the original Who. You like it's the black and white? so corny. <laughs> but it's that, the they, best. You like the cavemen. Yeah. And it's, it's, you know, it took me years to get Vic to watch it. Uh, but I will get you to watch some of those, and maybe some of the animated. And I want to watch Sixie. Sixie? Yeah, Sixie's her... She decided she liked Sixie because the outfit, and I even got her a Sixie hoodie. Um... Uh, he is back, and sh maybe I'll get you to listen to some of his audio plays, because his, his, his character is so redefined by Big Finish that he has gone from the most disliked doctor to a lot of people's favorite. And it was announced today that his, first comp his second companion, Mel Bush, played by the amazing Bonnie Langford, um, she, that, and she appeared... She, she was in the 60th anniversary, this, the Jody's Farewell in the, the, the help group where all the old companions were in the self-help group, but she's coming back as in this, in the sick for the 60th anniversary. So I'm excited that was announced today. So, but then you, um, so I had to give you some homework Mm -hmm. And I gave you the option of starting at season one of Modern Who and getting to the beginning of season six as we are covering the Impossible Ash, Ash or not, and Day of the Moon. Mm -hmm. And then she got to about she got about 15 episodes in for with her schedule and everything going on at home and travel and blah blah blah. She'd been taking care of her mom. A, she got to. She's into Tenet, but she's freaked out by Cassandra. <laughs> the skin, the piece of skin. Uh, nope. <laughs> nope. Played, played by the world famous Zoe Wanamaker, but she even freaked out in New Earth when she came back. Oh, no, it was the pussy faced humans that freaked uh -huh. out. <laughs> yeah, she's easily grossed out. As you heard uh, a couple episodes ago, where she was screaming about Tim Shaw. Mm -mm. Teeth face man. Mm -mm. Nope. Yep. See, she there grossed her out. Nope. But so I gave her some more homework. Uh, we watched Silence in the Library together because it's a River Song is so important to Impossible Astronaut Day of the Moon and to the Matt Smith era. Uh, so we watched that. What did you think of that one with the library? I love that one. Did you like the creepy that it was things that live in the shadows and yeah. you don't see them? It's the dust in a shadow. And that's a, that's a Moffat story. It's um, it's in the Davies era. It's Russell Davies is who brought it back. But Moffat always had he did the Doctor dances. I am your mo are you my mummy? That's a Stephen Moffat script. I like that. Um, Blink and if you've watched he's yep. watched Blink with me. That's a Stephen Moffat script. Um, you will get to. In the season you're in now, 
I want you to keep going. They're going to, uh, oh, she watched School Reunion. So the next mm-hmm. one you're going to watch is called um, The Girl in the Fireplace, and it's a Moffat. Stephen Moffat one they get they it's really good who writes the who wrote the first season because I actually really liked um Eccleston Russell Davies is okay the way the show was the way the show works in in the old days you had a producer and a script editor the script editor hired four or five people and then he would rewrite as necessary and the producer was in charge in modern who because post it's the, what, what I call, I use Whedon as much, the Whedon model, where your showrunner is the creator, Davies is the creator, but Dave, Russell Davies is one of the most important writers in television history in England, maybe in the world now. Uh, he's created so many amazing shows, Queer as Folk, Time After Time, uh, Year After Year, I mean, um, It's a Sin, uh, he's done this, he's, he's done other things, but he wrote, he for the season you watch with Eccleston, he hired only people who had written Doctor Who in another medium. Okay. They're all from the same circle of friends. He wrote he wrote most of them. Moffat wrote the two-parter with the Mummy Kid. Rob um, Robert Sherman wrote. Um, oh, good God! Which one did he, he wrote Dalek, which is the single Dalek. There was there's one Dalek in the. the because originally they had the Daleks, then Terry Nation, who created him's wife, his estate said, no, you can't use them. So they created a new monster. And then they, she said, though his wife relented and uh, they added, I think they added a zero to the fee. Uh, <laughs> well, she's living Sometimes off my, she's, 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 she's got, she's, um, his family's well taken care of. Not only they do have Dalek money, they have MacGyver money because he was the script editor on MacGyver. So that's probably a good Thing so and then Mark Gatiss, who you know and like as an actor, he was in Sherlock and he wrote some of that. He wrote Charles Dickens Christmas, said at Christmas with the okay. with the gas ghosts, the fart ghosts. Okay. Um, and then and having read a book by Davies and you don't know this and a TV writer, they're called Benjamin Cook. They <laughs> took a book and it's made up of all the email texts other correspondence between Benjamin Cook and Russell Davies during the last year and a half as his run on it, you find out that he rewrote almost everything. Okay. His rain, rain, main writers got a pass, and then he would do a polish. He didn't have to do as much of a polish in season one. Oh, and Paul Cornell, who um, he did, that's the other, he's the other writer. They had all written Doctor Who for either a novel or an audio play. Moffat had written a comedy special for charity. Um, but he would do a rewrite, except Moffat. He never read Ma. He didn't hear Moffat's until he went to the table read. That's how much he's like, I'm Russell Davies, but you're Stephen Moffat. They're like two of the biggest names in television over there. Uh, Moffat did, you know, I don't know if you've ever heard of a show called Coupling. It's kind of like Friends, but it's better. Yep. That's his show. His first show was about a, a high school newspaper with, um, Julie Schwala from uh, Absolutely Fabulous played the daughter. Mm-hmm. She was the star of that. Cool. Uh, and then he's done, you know, Sherlock and the uh, the Dracula. Um, and he just did a play. He wrote a play about social media and Mark Gatiss directed it. And it just did, a, I think it was on the West End. Yeah. Um, but Davies was a head writer and he's re- he was a rewriter. He is a control freak. He is like Whedon. I'm in, you're going to give me a draft, but I'm going to punch it up. And if you're, I've listened to uh, commentaries on Buffy things, and Jane Epperson, who I think is probably my favorite Buffy writer, she would say, my episodes are 99% me, all the funny bits are Joss. Okay. Because it's like, but, and, but Davies is like that. So Moffat became the showrunner when Davies left. He was the one selected by Davies and Julie Gardner to take over. Okay. Um, and he doesn't rewrite other people. He he writes, I mean, he goes, he gives notes and stuff like that probably, and there's probably some polish, but he's not that much of a control freak. But okay. he would write half the episodes. My favorite Davies episodes are the ones written by Moffat. 
Okay. Uh, the Davies here. Mine are normally Girl in the Fireplace, Blink, and The Library are three of my favorite Doctor Who stories. But Moffat took over, and this is his season. And you can tell because Davies has a lit. Did you get a difference in the vibe? Kind of how, like, the way they talk is at a higher speed. There's a little, little, like, I, I compare him to, uh, to Aaron Sorkin. There's a bounce to it. Mm-hmm. There's a rhythm, yeah. like it's music. Um, yeah. I think he writes in that. And the, the big speech of fine is a little more flowery, which is. Yeah. So, so we watched the library. Then she, um, so what did we watch? We want, uh, I'm forgetting the what name of this one. We watched. Whatever uh, with the angels. Yeah, the second Weeping Angels, which is Time of the Angels and Flesh and Stone. And then she watched the the finale, the Pandorica Opens, which is probably my favorite modern season finale, because I don't like a lot of the season finales. Um, I think they try to top themselves, and it's boring and dull. And um, and it's also the, the time when they try to ki- when they kill him. It's like, the, I don't like the Christmas special. Half the Christmas special, the Doctor dies in it. Um you know, so, but then we watched the two stories we're covering today, which is The Impossible and Astronaut and The Day of the Moon. The Impossible Astronaut and Day of the Moon. Story 6.01. Writer, Stephen Moffat. Director, Toby Haynes. Producer, Marcus Williams, executive producers, Stephen Moffat, Piers Wegner, and Beth Willis. Originally aired April 23rd and April 30th, 2011. Prelude. At the White House, President Nixon receives a call from a young girl. She says she's got his private number from the spaceman, and the monsters are everywhere, but to see them you must look behind you. Story. Amy, Rory, and Riversong receive invites to meet the doctor in Utah, where he tells them they're going to 1969. First, they picnic beside Lake Silencio in the desert, but a figure in an Apollo spacesuit emerges from the water and shoots the doctor dead. They burn his body, then are shocked to discover he also invited a younger version of himself, but cannot tell him of his fate. In April 1969, President Nixon recruits ex-FBI agent Canton Delaware to investigate strange phone calls he is receiving from a girl. The TARDIS lands invisibly in the Oval Office and the doctor convinces the president to let him help. Amy encounters a silent, a creature that can only be remembered while being observed. The doctor traces the calls to a warehouse in Florida and finds alien equipment and NASA space gear there. River and Roy follow some cables along tunnels that lead to a time vessel that the doctor encountered in Aikman Road, see, the lodger. Quickly forgetting the silence they encounter, Amy tells the doctor she is pregnant. They hear the girl calling for help, but find only the astronaut from the lake. Amy shoots in hope of preventing the doctor's death before realizing the frightened girl is inside the suit. Over the next three months, the doctor's companions travel across America investigating how prevalent, prevalent, the silence are. Canton pretends to hunt them down and has their bodies brought to Area 51 in Nevada, where the doctor is imprisoned in a cell of impervious dwarf star alloy. Hidden in the cell is the invisible TARDIS, and they all escape. The doctor interjects them, injects them with the recording devices to help them remember if they have seen a silent. Not only do the creatures wipe themselves from their memory when no longer observed, they can also implant commands. Amy and Canton trace the girl to a rundown children's home whose custodian has been driven half mad by continued exposure to the silence. Amy finds a bedroom with photos of the girl and one of herself with a baby, but is then kidnapped by the silence. Canton wounds one, which the doctor questions, and it tells him, Silence will fall. The girl has freed herself from the spacesuit and fled. The doctor examines it and finds it is enhanced with alien technology, including the ability to use any communication system, which is how the girl called the president. Canton records the injured silence saying humans should kill him on sight. The doctor confronts the silence in their time vessel, where they are holding Amy, and shows them live footage of the Apollo moon landing. 
As Neil Armstrong steps onto the surface, Canton adds the recording into the video feed and the silence instructions to be killed on site is televised around the world. A clip will be viewed for generations to come, ensuring the creature's elimination on Earth. River shoots all those in the time vessel, leaving it without a crew. Amy tells a doctor she was mistaken about being pregnant, although a scan reports both positive and negative results. Six months later, the girl is in New York, homeless and dying, so she regenerates. And another little note in this synopsis says, when first broadcast, the first episode was dedicated to Elizabeth Sladen, who played Sarah Jane and died April 19th, 2011. This again is another wonderful synopsis by Paul Smith in the New Who program guide with a forward by the amazing Jean-Marc Leofficer. Get one, folks. They're great to have. They need to do an updated one through Jody. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So what did you what did you think of this one? Oh, there, she had to watch it a couple times. Hello, Hugs. Hugs is also guesting on on the podcast. She's now shooting me. She's mooning me. <laughs> so what did you think of this ep- these episodes? Um, I well, I thought that they were a little harder to follow than the previous episodes. Yes, they are. Um. And I mean, so from that standpoint, they were a little confusing. Well, that's, I mean, there was I, definitely I, parts that I felt were confusing. I didn't understand how they fit in. Um, but for the most part, it, it was, um, you know, it was still really fun and interesting and the, um, aliens, a, like I felt like a kid watching X Files. They are very much. It's like they've got the bodies of Mulder and Scully and the heads of the great. The great. The what is it? They called the Greys. I don't remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but no, I loved no. X Files, and it felt it felt very X Files. Yeah, I, th- I, and I I really enjoyed that. I kind of wish we had watched it together, after I rewatched it because I haven't watched it in a few years. Because I haven't really watched a lot of modern Who unless it was whatever the new episodes were in the last, since the pandemic, really in the last three, four, three years. I've been watching a lot of classic, but that's one because of the Blu-ray sets and, ta- you know, and just having rewatched the modern stuff over and over and over. Every time a new season was about to come out, I'd rewatch everything. That Moffat leans into the time trap. He, and this is a good example of it, Blink's an example of it. Meeting River Song out of order, and this is big because she talks about it very specifically in this one. Is yeah, because and I love that when she's talking to Rory, and I don't want to spoil. You find out who River is in the middle of this season, so when you get back to this season, rewatch all this because in the middle of the season you're going to find out who River Song is. Okay. Uh, and it's important. It's really important. But as at this point, all we know is is they're meeting each other backwards. Yeah. And but she knows him more she, and more. And he yeah, the first time that. he meets her is the day she dies. Okay. So, and that's why in this one, the, I thought the timey-wimey part would get to you. So did you get confused that the doctor that called, that when they meet the doctor in the desert, he's not the one that's been called there. It's he's 200 years younger. Yeah, so she, yes, but only. Or two, two, 200 years older. Yeah, because she did, because she said that. Yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, it's kind of confusing that, and you saw him die in the in the spacesuit, and then did you get what was going on? That the little girl in the spacesuit. No, I don't. I don't under. I don't understand the little spe- girl in the spacesuit because the spacesuit. It sounds like the spacesuit like was living on her own but she said something about she was going to be eaten yeah the alien i think it's but i think it's a little kid describing being forced to going into the empty space suit that could walk by itself they're going to eat me yeah so but you saw at the end that she regenerate she started to regenerate oh that's what was happening that's I, all remember, I saw at the end was i literally went what the okay, fun. remember at the, in the beginning when he gets shot from the disc, you see him turn glow. That's what happens when they regenerate. They glow, they go into the Christ-like That's figure, right. and all the energy shoots out. That's right. So 
she's regenerating. And these are all clues to there are two this but Moffat liked to divide the seasons in half. There would be a break at mid season. I hate it. They do it over in this country with some shows, and I really hate it. But there's a mystery of why there's a nursery in that room. Why are there pictures of Amy with the baby when she's just now pregnant? Who is River Song? Who are the Silence? Because the Silence, remember in the one where we watched his first appearance, the snake thing, where the monster goes, the Silence, Silence will fall. Mm -hmm. and, it, and then it doesn't pay off until this season because that's what the aliens are. They're the Silence. Yes. Yeah. So, but what is the silence? Did you like the fact that they were, uh, uh, what did you think of the fact that when they looked at him and then they turned away, they forgot about him? I thought that was cool. Yeah. Um, that's cool. I like that one. They're kind of creepy and stuff. Like, um, so what did you, what did you think? Well, how do you, what do you think of Matt Smith? Oh, uh, he's, uh, he's great as the doctor. Okay. Uh, for sure. I mean, I, the first so I, because I am not a Doctor Who fan, yeah. I um, the first thing I really ever saw him in was The Crown. Yeah, it's, it's so hard it's to imagine fun. that's the same actor because he is so still. Vic yeah, watched The so, Crown and went, I didn't know he could stand still. Yeah, so <laughs> it was really fun to see how different he is. Are you and, watching him in the new Game of Thrones? He's the he's star of the new Game of oh, Thrones. Oh, yeah. I did. I watched a couple episodes of House of Dragons. And again, like, he's a very different character. And I really, um, you know, so I, I really like being able to see his acting chops. Yeah, he, um, is 20, he was 26 years old. Yeah, and he was so, yeah, he was so good uh, as the doctor. And it was fun. Um I was like, God damn, he gets, what a good day for Matt Smith. He gets to make out with Alex Kensington. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, he, he, um, they're very funny together because they are, there's a huge difference in their age. I mean, yeah. she's not old enough to be his mom, but she's a good 15 years older than he is because he had only done like one or two things. He'd done a show called Party Animals, which was a huge success as a drama. It was about being a, um, an aide into a, a politician and he had been the sidekick to Billy Piper in um, a mystery show called, uh, Oh, I forget what it's called, but she played the lead. And they did two of those 90 minute mystery movies set in like in Victorian time or Edwardian time, but he was an unknown. They had this, they had a special on them and had a special uh, D, doctor who confidential where they introduced him and everybody was like, who is this guy? Um, but he had me once he popped his head out and give me an apple in that scene. Um, so I, yeah, do, do, she did laugh at you. Uh, you did like the, the scene where he's trying all the foods while he's mellowing out. Yes, I did. And I also, um, I mean, e even in, from that episode, but just watching several episodes, I also see why he's your why you identify him as your doctor. Yeah. Uh, he's just, he's, he's, he's got it. He's got a, he's got the alienness. He's very different. He's silly, which is weird. Cause he's a, he's most like Tom Baker. And I really, that's a curly head gay guy with the scarf. The most, the, what we call like the most, the most famous in America doctor. Um, in that aspect that he doesn't act human at all. Yeah. In a way that he would not, no one would work, act like that. Um, and you know Karen Gillan mostly from Marvel movies, right? Um, I actually know her from that um, very short-lived sitcom, Selfie. She was good in that. Yes. Where was her, where but was that's her, actually who, the first thing was I Was that with Cal her. Penn? Hmm? Who was it? It was with the guy, one of the guys from Harold and Kumar, right? I think so. Yeah. yeah. I don't remember for sure. Yeah, the one that's still an actor, and not a pol political guy. Um, yeah, she's she's really good in this. She's really good. But she, did, you, oh, you haven't seen her. She does appear in, te uh, there are several actors in Modern Who that appear as one character and then are hired as a companion. Freema Adjaman that you watched in New Amsterdam, she appeared in 
the end of season two as one character, and then they made her Martha Jones, the companion that replaces Rose, and she's the cousin of the girl that was in the finale. They see she's, you know, and cool. and then Karen Gillan is a, a priestess when um, David Tennant's doctor and Donna go to Pompeii. Okay. That's um, very uh, Law and Order-esque. It is. Well, it's also uh, Sixy appeared as Count... Uh, Chief, uh, the chief guard of Gallifrey, uh, Castellan something, Max L, and he he laser beamed Peter Davison, and then the next year when Peter Davison left, he was cast as the Doctor. <laughs> so it's happened before. Um, people who have appeared more than once in Doctor Who and come back, you know, and played a different part. Um, so, so I mean. The timey wimey threw you off, but did you kind of get what was going on when they get to the second episode when they were um, the FBI agent, the gay, the FBI agent played by Mark Shepard, who you don't know who Mark Shepard is, you <clears throat> do you? Does he does that name doesn't mean anything to you, does it? No, it does not. He is a king of genre. He is kind of like on the level for nerds, like Jamie Lee Curtis is for genre. He has okay. appeared in. Uh, he's been in Star Trek, I think. I don't remember, but he was in Battlestar Galactica. He was one of the stars of Supernatural for a few Nine? years. Yeah, he played Crowley, um, uh, a demon, and then King of Hell. Um, yeah, he is in a, he's in a Star Trek Voyager. Um, and several other things. And... Just so you know, the guy that played the older version of him, yeah, that's his dad. Oh, that's cool. Who's another genre king? Uh, who's played Klingons and other aliens, and um, he was in the first J.J. Abrams Star Trek movie as a Vulcan. Noise. Yeah, but that's that was a neat thing is to get these two guys that are renowned for being in science fiction shows uh, to play father and son. Fun. So, and I, I do. Like, I, I'm a big fan of his. He can do. He, I'll watch him in anything. And I loved. I loved him in Supernatural. I loved him in Supernatural. Um, was there anything in Supernatural that you didn't like? I there were. There were some. There was a couple weak seasons. But even the weakest season, they found a reason to say the word "dick" every five or every episode by naming the the villain Dick. Um, I. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I did like the line, now that you've said that, I, I did love the line, oh, uh, Dicky, Tricky Dicky, or whatever. Oh, yeah, yeah. He said, you they're, will be remembered forever. They're not going to, yeah. Um, and I do, um, I do like that actor. I know him from a bunch, he, I think he's a Canadian who lives in England and plays, he's their patented, I need an American. Mm. Um, he was also... He was uh, in the first season of a show called Jonathan Creek um, okay. about a magician who solves crimes starring Alan Davies. And okay. He played his agent. He played his American agent because he was like an international. He No, no, he was an American magician and Alan Davies' character, Jonathan Creek, designed the tricks. Okay. He did the tricks, but um, uh, Stuart Milligan. And I thought he did a pretty good Nixon. He doesn't. He didn't lean into it. He didn't do the old uh, impersonation kind of thing. Yeah. You know the shaking of the jowls and all that. He just played Nixon. Yeah. And I like the David Frost line. Yeah, I did too. Yeah, that's I, that's a movie when we when I purged all those DVDs when we moved in together. I did keep my copy of Frost Nixon. It was such a good such a good movie. Um, so. All right, so in this one, you see, so you don't have any, like, you, you weren't even born when we went to the moon. No. We had stopped going. You weren't even, they were done. Um, yeah, I think the only. Last one was in 72. Yeah, no, even my older brother wasn't around. I know, I saw that face. I mean, yeah, as I was 
four going on five when they landed on the moon and I remember it. It's one of the earliest yep. things I remember because my day, you know, my pops going, wake up, you got to see this. Yeah, no, I was in kindergarten or first grade when the Challenger blew up. Oh, I, was, I have a hard time remembering which grade because I was in the same classroom for both years. I was a freshman in college and it happened about 10 o'clock in the morning and just the campus shut down. Yep. We all went into the commons because they served beer in there then because the drinking age was 19. Yep. And we got everybody just sat there and drank all day and watched it blow up over and over again, basically. Yeah, uh, yeah, but, we were, uh, you know, it was a huge deal because the teacher was going, and so every kid in and America was traumatized. Was watching. Yeah, an entire generation was traumatized. Yeah. Um, but see, see I kind of like in the historical part, I liked it because I'm an, you know, I'm a, I'm an astronaut nut, and you know, I just, I thought it was cool that they went to, you know, and that. Did, what did you think of the doctor overcoming? What the hell is that? Is that that was Mr. Costner's toy. Oh, okay. Um, that the doctor hid the subliminal message in the moon landing TV footage so people would turn on the silence and kill them. That oh, was cool. Yeah. I th yeah, I thought that was really good cause I, um, because I did the whole time I was wondering. I was like, I don't. What does the, I don't understand what going to the moon has to do with this. And so, um, yeah, so it was nice to see that come together. And it was pretty ingenious. Yeah, I liked it. And I, because he even says that, she's when uh, Amy asks him, why would they come to Earth and use our tech? And the doctor goes, because it's cool. And he puts on when he's got the helmet on. And yeah. it's, you know, it, it, it made sense. And there's, Moffat does these big things where like, oh, there are all these tunnels under the earth because the silence has been manipulating us for all of history. Right. Um, you know, and stuff that, you know, doesn't really make sense. But then there's a lot to, and British science fiction is like that. American science fiction is Star Trek, here's why the ship works, who cares? Where theirs is, yes, there's an alien that when you're not looking at them, you forget them. There's one that's a statue when you look at them. Yep. And the crack on the wall. He got that from his kids. There was a crack in his kid's wall, and he realized that that must be really freaking them out. Because his kids were little, and he was, he was, he, as Vic would point out, he harvested their fears. Yeah. And, and used them, so. Of course. I mean, why would you not? Oh, no, no. Just remember the stuff that scared you. And he, Doctor Who would got crap in its past for being too scary. Um, especially in like the Tom Baker, his first three years, um, the create the producer and showrunner leaned into the horror. Let's scare the kids. Kids like to be scared. He wanted to lay down in his grave. Oh. Look at the little baby. Oh, hi Costner. He's got both fangs out. Okay, now I feel like I can come. I can sit back down. Okay. Yeah, folks. She's been walking around making sure the dogs poop. Well, and that he doesn't pee in our friend's house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, Leslie is dog sitting. I have friend's dog and took our dogs there so they could run in the yard so she wouldn't have to walk them. Well, and it worked out because we have all the smoke from the. Yes, folks. You even wildfires believe... and the air is terrible. Yeah, it is. It's really bad. It's really bad. It smells like a tire fire. So, but I'm glad you liked it. So, uh, because you had to jump around your, I mean, and this isn't your kind of genre. No. I mean, she watches all the hot superhero movies with me. And she likes them. I love those. Yes. And we watch Sweet Tooth together. And love that. Yeah. Cannot recommend it high, high, highly enough. It's just amazing. And um, other things. I mean, I think I really, I will say that, um, you know, because it's so campy and corny i do really love old who um the original mm -hmm. the og um so you'd watch I, more of that than the cartnell stuff yeah oh. um but i do really i really like um stephen moffat storytelling yeah and i don't know who wrote um uh 
Jodie Whittaker seasons. But that I really was that I, was Chris Chibnall who wrote for both Moffat and Davies. Okay, and so I really liked um, her stories as well, and I think some of it is that they is that there were weren't there a few that were serials. She did liked, her her final read. season was one long serial. Yeah, and I like I really like that. See, and that was the first time I had ever seen Doctor Who because in Old Who it was one episode, twenty five minutes, once a week. So you would have cliffhangers, but I didn't see it that way. I grew up watching it in what they call an omnibus format, edited together in as a movie on TV in DC. Right. The first four years of ba Tom Baker, I could see two episodes with a cliffhanger every day. So it really didn't feel that way. But that was the first time I ever kind of saw it serialized. Moffat, so the way Modern Who did, did does, it's the big bad, the, the Whedon model is, they had a word, bad wolf. Okay. Bad wolf, and then you end up, what's bad wolf? Bad wolf's just the corporation. Rose is bad wolf. Uh, and then season two, you've heard the word, but season two, you keep hearing the word Torchwood, and then it pays off in the finale. Um, okay. Moffat does, it's not really serialized, but there's a through line. So what's set up here with the spacesuit, person in the spacesuit, whoever that is that killed the doctor, that all it plays into... The mid-season finale kind of ties up one bow, and then the other bow is tied up in um, the finale. So okay. Moffat would do those. Sometimes his are a little rough. His second season, I, um, um, this this is, I'm not as fond of this season as I am of season five. I think Matt Smith's first season is near perfect. And yeah. This one's got some episodes that I'm not as I may go watch you know watch them again and like them, but I'm not as fond of them, um, except when he's in them. And right. So this one I really don't like the finale to this season. It's just it's a it's just a mess. But yeah, but Moffat Moffat's pretty good. He's got a good group of writers. He uses Gatus a bunch, which is good, um, and he does good scary ones. So. Mm -hmm. One where they they're trapped in a dollhouse and the toys are trying to kill them. Ooh, that sounds cool. That yeah, sounds it, interesting and fun. A little bit of Chucky. Yeah, well, yeah, it's creepier than Chucky. Excellent. Yeah, yeah, it's in this season because uh, Amy and Roy are well. Amy and Roy make it through mid-season of season seven, and then they're replaced with Clara. Okay. So, and then Clara stays through two years of. Capaldi. She's okay. the longest serving modern companion in number of episodes. Uh, the young lady that played Yasmin is the longest in length of time because there were long gaps between seasons. Right. So, um, But I'm glad you liked this one. I mean, it, I'm glad you had to rewatch it. We had, um, folks, it, we're recording this a day after our city had its first mass shooting. And it was on, basically on the campus of the university where Leslie works, and my job, it's for the hospital affiliated with that university. Yeah. So, uh, and my team, other members of my team had to res set up a command center in the hospital because the victims came to us. Uh, and it was a really bad day. Yeah. So, Leslie had to watch it again today which I'm glad because she was very distracted and turned it off and I don't blame her. We almost didn't record because I was, if she didn't get a chance to watch it. Yeah. But I wanted her to enjoy it. I do want you to continue to watch New Who because I'll probably make you come on the show again. That's fine. And maybe when um, I do the next second Doctor One, uh -huh. which is in black and white, you can come on and do that one, which uh -huh. I don't even remember which one it is. Um, but thank you for coming on, honey. Um, you're you're a good guest. You just, you know, you're you got your little uh, stage fright, but you were good. <laughs> she was fussing, folks. She was like, "I'm gonna be bad." It's like, "No, you're not. You'll be fine." Um, but 
I'm glad you watched it, and I, and I think I will pencil you in for the second Doctor, because you've not seen a second Doctor one, have you? It's a little dark guy, that, uh, mop black hair, bow tie, plays a recorder. I can't remember. Yeah, well, he's staring at you in the living it's, room. It's been, uh, yeah, it's been a little while since we watched any of the old episodes. That's true. That's so true. I, I can't remember. Um, so, uh, yeah. Yeah, y'all. Yeah. So, but yeah, it was, um, I mean, I'll definitely go back and watch the episodes that I missed in season five. Um, and I had seen the Van Gogh episode before because we watched that with um, Vic. Mm -hmm. um, and it really liked that episode then. So, um, yeah. So, I, I mean, I'll go back and watch what I, what I haven't seen yet. The, um, I really like the... Um, the like flying dragon type of monsters. Oh, you liked the one with Father's Day, didn't you? Where Rose Rose yeah. tries to save her dad and it just Yeah. Um and I I'm a little curious about the mechanics of how that creature flies. Um cuz okay. it I would need to I think I would need to look at it more carefully. Um but it's a uh, yeah, so I I definitely I like the monsters and the the, the creepy things. I just don't want any more um, skin stuff. That's I don't like that. Okay, so the next next second doctor <laughs> one, the next second doctor one is one that is missing in its entirety. So, but it was animated, and it is one I really loved it animated. It's I call it in this. It's the one produced by Big Finish, and mm -hmm. their animation. Uh, the people they hired to do the animation, little Scooby Doo. Oh, cool! You know, it's a little but, but, but awesome. But, but see, we can watch that, and you may have to do more homework because I only have it on Blu-ray. Do I have it on? Oh, good, I have it. I have it in both an American edition and in a UK version. Um, but we'll watch it in color in the animation, and then I may have you watch the reconstruction in black and white. Which okay. is just the still photograph, so you can see what it would look like in 1965 mm -hmm. compared to how they modernized. Because they changed the set and stuff. Okay. They started to with the animation, go telling the animators, just don't. We're not reconstruct. We don't want to be. We don't want you to recreate what originally was there. Right. Use the photos as reference, but you know you can play with the camera angles and the colors. And, okay. So and I like it, and it is uh, a farewell to a companion story, and I think it's kind of creepy. Okay. So. Get out of there. Get, get, get. Who are you shooing? Hugs. Oh. She, she right. stuck her nose in my crochet hook bag. Okay. There's not even food in there. Okay. All right. Well, uh, we're going we're gonna to end this up. We're going to end this because we got a good length. It was a good episode. You, um, thank you again, honey. I appreciate it. I love you. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, it was very, it was very fun to watch. And, you know, time travel is confusing uh, and great. And I, yeah, I like all the monsters. And, uh, you know, I will enjoy trying to figure out the rest of this um, well, river song story. Well, th that's worth it. Um... I, I really like her. They they do tie her story up uh, when Moffat leaves. He does kind of tie it. He does kind of tie. It. But she's also they have a, she's done ten big finish sets. She her, she does a lot of big finish and her daughter's been in hers. She's really good. Jeff who said he didn't really care for River Song in the TV show. He listened to her on Big Finish and went oh I get it. Because when she's by herself she's very good. It's she's great. I think it was more the the Moffity part of it, but yeah. So, but keep watching Modern Who, and then if um, we'll see in November when Disney's getting everything. So I'm hoping that the animated stuff will be on there, the incomplete stuff that is not in American Brit Box but is in UK Brit Box. 
Okay. Will be on Disney. Okay. So I'm kind of looking forward to that, even though I do, it is something I keep in physical media because I don't trust streaming people. Right. And, and it's just expensive. Yeah. All right. Also so folks. So, folks, um, I don't have any recommendations. Uh, go see Guardians of the Galaxy 3. Me and Leslie saw it this past weekend, and we loved it. Yeah. It was very good finale to that series of films from James Gunn and his team. I really yeah. liked it. And we both highly recommend Sweet Tooth. I recommend TV and the book. They are very different. The book is way darker. Uh, but I'm a big fan of Jeff Lemire, who created it. So... Yeah. All right, folks. Well, we'll be. Um, I'll be back in two weeks with Mark McManus from Trap One and Ian from All of Time and Space, and we will talk Last Christmas, uh, Peter Capaldi Christmas special. And I have special guests uh, lined up for Jody, and hopefully we're recording this Saturday. And we will be covering the woman who fell to earth. We're gonna I'm gonna start treating it as um, Jody's era as past doctor and reevaluate it one episode at a time. And when I get back to first doctor Jason from Doctor Who Literature will join me. We will talk Dalek invasion of Earth, which I always like watching. Speaking of Daleks again, sorry. Okay. That was just the weirdest. I had to text our friend Anna. Oh, when, when you watched Dalek? When I watched the Dalek, yeah, and it, you got to see inside. I was like, what? It's just, it's a brain with tentacles. And she, <laughs> and she was like, yeah, they're angry little squids. No wonder they're such assholes. <laughs> it's true. Wait until you see one that's a human uh, Dalek hybrid. I want to see what your reaction when you what? get it. Yeah, it's kind of gross. And I want to see if you had the same opinion that I have of what the makeup looks like. But you got to get through. It's in season three, middle of season three. It's okay. Daleks Take Manhattan. Okay. Yeah. it's. Set. I have a feeling it's not like when the Muppets Take Manhattan. Uh, no, it's not. <laughs> All right, folks. So we'll be back in two weeks with uh, Last Christmas. Th thanks again uh, to my lovely wife. And we, we will see you somewhere in time or space. <laughs>